production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Hello, I'm Sam Lehman, a junior at Shaker Heights High School and a member of the Youth Forum Council. It's my pleasure to introduce today's forum, a conversation on partisanship on, in the United States Supreme Court. The nine judges who hold seats on the U.S. Supreme Court, the highest federal court of the United States, are responsible for the final interpretations of the law. In recent history, their decisions have upheld President Trump's travel ban, Ohio's voter purging laws, and ruled in favor of the Colorado bakery owner who refused to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. For 12 years, Justice Anthony Kennedy represented a swing vote. However, his impending retirement and the appointment of a new justice has the potential to change the, the Supreme Court's composition for decades. Judge Brett M. Kavanaugh, President Trump's nominee to replace Justice Kennedy, has been faced with deeply partisan support and pushback throughout Congress's confirmation hearings. Today at 10 a.m., those hearings continued with Dr. Christine Blasey Ford testifying Judge Kavanaugh's alleged sexual assault against her in high school. These allegations have furthered the partisan divide in the confirmation hearings. This is not the first time we've witnessed partisan actions in regards to the judicial branch. However, the role of partisanship seems to be extending beyond the nominee's nominee process to within the court's decisions. Are party lines dividing the U.S. Supreme Court? Is the court at risk for becoming just another tool for the major parties to enact political change, rather than upholding the beliefs of, rather than upholding the ideals of American democracy? Joining us today are local and national experts who will share their thoughts and perspectives. Our panelists include Jonathan L. Enton, is the David L. Brennan Professor Emeritus of Law and Adjunct Professor, Professor of Political Science at the Case Western Reserve University School of Law. A graduate of Brown University and Northwestern University, he was a law clerk to then judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she was on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and did applet litigation at Steptoe and Johnson in Washington, D.C., before joining the law faculty in 1984. Professor Enton remains active in the law school and continues his research and writing on constitutional law and civil rights issues. Jeremy Paris joins us as the former chief counsel for nominations on the Senate Judiciary Committee, serving as a lead staffer for then-chairman Patrick Leahy, a Vermont Democrat, on four Supreme Court nominations. He is returning to Cleveland full-time to open a Cleveland office of the Rabin Group, a Washington, D.C. consultancy that considers itself the nation's largest majority-minority-owned public policy, strategic consulting, and communications firm. Lisa A. Tucker is an associate professor of law in the Thomas R. Klein School of Law at Drexel University. After earning her JD cum laude from Harvard Law School, she practiced with two Boston firms from 2009 to 2011. Professor Tucker wrote the Plain English column on SCOTUS blog, and she continues to contribute to the blog from time to time. Here to guide our discussion is Youth Forum Council member Nehal Chugrapati. Nehal, I turn the forum over to you. Thank you, Sam. So thank you all for being here, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists for participating in this discussion. So obviously, we find ourselves in a very important moment in history with these uh, hearings of Christine Blasey Ford, so I think we should start off with that. So how do each of you think the partisanship in Congress has affected this nomination process and has affected how Christine Blasey Ford is being heard by Congress? Um, I guess we can start with you, Mr. Anton. Well, I think that this is the culmination of a long-running process that has seen increasing partisan division about members of the Supreme Court and about the mission of the Supreme Court. Uh, I think that that division, we can talk about it in more detail as we, as we go along, but I think that, that that division reflects some changes in the political parties themselves uh, and in the people. Uh, I think that the parties today are more ideologically divided between the parties uh, than they have been in my lifetime, uh, and maybe for even longer than that. Uh, we are now at a point where it is almost impossible to talk about a conservative Democrat 
or a liberal Republican. Uh, there are studies of ideology showing that the most conservative Senate Democrat, probably Joe Manchin, is more liberal than the most liberal Republican, maybe that's Susan Collins. That in turn reflects things out among the people and among the, the class of politically active folks who uh, support the parties, and it makes it much more difficult for the confirmation process to proceed in anything other than a kind of political pitch battle. Um, well, uh, thanks for having me today. Who here is from Shaker Rice High School besides me? All right, I'm a, I'm a proud Shaker grad, so thanks for uh, being here. Uh, it's okay to be interviewed by somebody from the US, I guess. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, it's hard, it's actually been very hard for me to watch and trying to digest these hearings in real time. You know, when we, first of all, when we said we'd do this panel, we, we knew that, that there's, this would be a hot topic, it would be a round of vote uh, on the nominee. We, we did not imagine that we'd be sitting here today in real time sort of taking a break from watching this emotional hearing. So I have a, just a couple quick thoughts, uh, you know, before saying maybe smarter things, but um, I'm having a hard time. Um, I, uh, I am not a survivor of sexual assault, but I think many, many people are, uh, many people know people who are in watching this hearing, I think is, is bringing a lot of emotion for if, if any of you are, and I hope you're not, I hope you're doing self care and taking care of yourself because this is a hard topic and hard to discuss. Um, I think it's also educational and important, uh, uh, the prevalence of sexual violence in our society uh, uh, and whether we believe survivors when they come forward. And that is our political moment. The, the Me Too moment, even more than the partisan moment, I think that's the moment we're seeing now and learning about what happens when a survivor comes forward. Um, I will tell you that I, I have, I, I read her testimony and found it very credible. I don't think people who lie call for FBI investigations uh, uh, into their claims. Um, I think, I don't think that uh, people who lie ask for other witnesses to be subpoenaed. Um, I, and then watching her testimony was heartbreaking. Uh, watching her say in response to a question earlier, uh, the most important thing, uh, do, do you, you know, what is the, the most searing memory, what is your most searing memory of the assault was the laughter, the laughter. And I had a really hard time in thinking about having to address all of you, especially a, gr a group of students, think about how to talk about this. It's, it's uh, reprehensible and embarrassing the way that the committee is taking, doing this hearing. It shouldn't be happening, there should be an investigation first. I worked on these hearings, I ran these hearings, this is wrong. Uh, it is wrong, but, but her courage, Dr. Blasey Ford's courage is something that shines through to me. Um, the other thing I'll say is I'm almost struck by partisanship is clearly at play in the, the whole, the sort of the people in their corners, right? And, and how you, you were saying on our way in, how few votes are really at issue, which I think reflects that sort of sad truth. Um, uh, I think the stakes of this nomination, the, the consequences, the context of the long Hatfield v. McCoy fight is important. Uh, uh, the fact that President Obama's last nominee didn't even get a hearing is important. Um, but the moment that I'm thinking, and maybe this is wrong, is that when, when we had Anita Hill uh, and the Clarence Thomas hearings, uh, uh, it led to the year of the woman in 1992. Uh, I was a senior in high school, uh, the year of the woman in politics, where all of a sudden, for the first time, you had not women in, in big numbers elected to the Senate and, and to the House of Representatives. I think that's the moment we're having. I think you have more and more women in the Senate. I think that women watching this and watching Chairman Chuck Grassley's uh, 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 tirade at the beginning of this hearing are saying, not anymore. So I think that it's even more than partisanship. I think that we're gonna see, see change in the composition of the Congress. I think this hearing is the searing moment that's gonna, gonna help lead us there. Well, first I wanna say thank you so much. And one thing that I'm really thrilled to be here for is to see all these young people who care about what's happening in the world right now and what's happening at the Supreme Court right now. Um, I am a law professor, but I've devoted my career to trying to communicate to the American public why the law, and particularly the Supreme Court, which I should say is my passion. My husband loves the Philadelphia Eagles. I love the Supreme Court. These are my players. <laughs> and um, I actually said to him a couple of days ago, Go Brown. Go Brown. yeah, oh, no, 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 no. He, he actually was a little concerned about my coming to Cleveland because of the Browns. Um, but, um, you know, I actually said to him a couple of days ago, can I still love this court? if we don't really have an investigation, if we don't have a full hearing and this person is confirmed. Can I, can, can I love a court where we have people who have been suspected of, and, and, and you know, my only hesitation um, about what's happening with Dr. Ford 
is simply that, and rightfully so, there is so much attention on what happened to Dr. Ford and the other two female witnesses who have come forward that people have stopped talking about a lot of other concerns we had about Judge Kavanaugh as well. Concerns about his finances, concerned about, concerns about potential perjury, um, concerns about the judge that he clerked for and massive wrongdoing by this judge and how it's possible that Judge Kavanaugh could not have known about it. Um, and so this is a moment in time when I'm so glad you guys committed to being here and I hope you will continue to com commit to be here. I am the mother of four daughters. Three of them are teenagers. Um, one of them is a sophomore in college and last year she had to accuse someone and go through a Title IX investigation of a young man who sexually harassed her on campus. It took a lot of courage for her to do that because we women self, we, we preserve ourselves. We take care of ourselves, we come together and we don't wanna be harassed, that's what happens. And as a result of having reported this young man and having him go through the disciplinary process, she's been harassed even more because other people say you shouldn't have gotten him in trouble. Um, so this is your moment is what I wanna say to you all. And, I, and to go back to Nahal's first question, the reason that this is an example of partisanship is because in the last few years, both the Democrats and the Republicans have had their moment, or so they thought. When Justice Scalia unexpectedly died, President Obama said, here is our moment. We can turn the court. We can turn the court to embrace individual rights and protect people and continue to provide health care for all and make sure that we have racial and gender equality and, and sexual orientation equality in this country. And that was his moment. And unfortunately, due to politics and partisanship, that moment passed us by. And now we have the Republicans saying, hell yeah, this is our moment. We now can take the Supreme Court and change it, not only for the next 40 years while Brett Kavanaugh would serve, but for decades after that, because the law that this court passes and, and rules on, and I shouldn't have said passes, they don't pass laws, but the, the law that this court makes, the way this court interprets the Constitution will last for generations. That is why, for example, Brown v. Board decided 1954, re-upped in 1956, and it has lasted this long and will continue to last. Fantastic thing but it can also go the other way. Law can happen, law can be made in the next decade, 40 years, however many years we have these justices together as a court that will last for your grandchildren. And so yes, partisanship, that's what it's all about. And that is why the Republicans are not backing down. They will not back down until the bitter end if they are absolutely forced to. And so you all, you young people, many of whom can already vote, because I'm assuming there are some 18 year olds in this room, or who can vote very, very soon, you need to care about this stuff, this who, matters. Who, who's gonna be 18 by the November election? Not, not many, just, just a couple of you? All right, well, next time around, go get them. Uh, and next you know, time. next time around is not long. It's next not time long. around, maybe next year, depending on what Cleveland and Ohio does. I don't know much because I'm from Pennsylvania. Or two years from now, we, absolutely. We, we have elections every two years here, just like. Okay, just well, like there's here. no yeah. like city council uh, or no, dog there are. That's right, that's right. or there anything are. like that. There are, but no, but it is. That's right. It's, yeah. It's um, and you can get involved at any level. You know, I'm, I'm just struck by you know the other part of that. You know, to get into our partisanship discussion, and I, I'm sure you're going to have thoughts on this, Professor. You know, the first thing that happened after Justice Scalia died, not to take it back too much, it, we are in this crazy moment where it's hard to think of anything else other than these allegations, but the context of how we got here, um, when Justice Scalia died suddenly, the first thing that happened was that Mitch McConnell, the Republican majority leader of the Senate, came out and said right away, 10 minutes later, essentially, President Obama will not, uh, will not confirm a single nominee of President Obama. We have to wait for the presidential election. That is based on no precedent. That is based on nothing. That was an invented standard. Let, let me just jump in on this because there actually is some precedent about Supreme Court appointments in presidential election years. Uh, the most striking example that, that comes to mind is 1916 um, when uh, Charles Evans Hughes, Justice okay, Charles asking, Evans Hughes. Okay, well, 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 wait a minute. Yeah. Justice Charles Evans Hughes resigned from the Supreme Court in 1916 to accept the Republican presidential nomination. 
If ever there was an argument for leaving the seat open, <laughs> it was then yeah. when we were going to be electing a president uh, who could be, fi who might be, who's, who might be in a position to fill that seat. His not own seat. His own his seat. Own not seat. only was there no suggestion that, that, uh, that we should defer uh, filling the seat, um, but uh, uh, the nominee, who was a federal district judge from Cleveland named John Clark, by the way, uh, uh, John Clark was confirmed by unanimous consent five weeks almost to the day after Charles Evans Hughes resigned from the court. Uh, in fact, when, when Senator McConnell stonewalled on Judge Garland, who by the way is not the most wildly liberal judge out there, very, very uh, moderate although, although, too, well, right, although certainly more liberal than, than uh, Justice Gorsuch sure, uh, or, or, judge, or Judge Kennedy. Um, it had been 150 years since the Senate had stonewalled a Supreme Court nomination. And that happened right after the Civil War when Andrew Johnson was the president and was on horrendous terms with Congress. Indeed, you may recall uh, Andrew Johnson was the first president ever impeached uh, by the House of Representatives. So we are living in a very different time than we used to be. And I don't mean to suggest in pointing to 1916 that, that the world was in some sort of golden age. Uh, politics has always affected the Supreme Court. After all, Supreme Court justices are nominated by presidents and they are confirmed by senators. This is a political institution and there is no way around that. The question is how firmly are the lines drawn and we are in a in a notably contentious and divided time. Um, Mrs. Tucker, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier about how you can't essentially look at the court if you have someone like Kavanaugh who's been accused of sexual assault on it. So how do you think having such a politicized nomination process affects the credibility of the court's decision or affects the dynamic on the court? Yeah, so when Chief Justice Roberts went on the court in 2000, Five, 2005, yes, fall of 2005. Um, one of the things he talked about, because he had been an advocate before the court, he had argued 39 cases before the court and was widely accepted as really the brilliant legal mind um, of his generation. And um, he, the, one of the very first things he talked about, and I was very lucky to have a chance to interview him at that time for a book I was writing, um, one of the very things he cared about the most was the legacy of the court and the legitimacy of the court. And if you think about it, really, it is completely miraculous that in this country we listen to the Supreme Court at all, right? Because we have this thing called the rule of law. And some of you have heard of that, maybe some of you haven't. I have law students who have never heard of that. But the rule of law says that when a court, when a judge says something, we do it. And there have been times in history where people tried to resist. Let's go back to Brown again, right? Some of the South, a couple of governors said, no way, not integrating the schools. And what happened? The court came back and said, you got to do it with all deliberate speed. And then the National Guard stepped in and made sure that that happened, right? But the fact is that we listen to the Supreme Court because we listen to the Supreme Court. That's what we do, right? That's how the law, rule of law functions. And so what was incredibly important to Chief Justice Roberts was to continue for the American public to see the court as legitimate, as concerned about reaching thoughtful decisions, as having a legacy of the rule of law that would always be carried forward. And he valued that and does still value that so very much. And so when we have a court that has members that may have their integrity questioned, it is really, really of concern because it's not just about those members. It's about the court in general. It's by who might be put on that court later. It's also about our legislators and our president. Can we trust them either? And our whole system, really, when we think it can't fall apart, watch. Well, and, and you know, it's, it's the kind of decisions that they're going to make. I mean, first of all, you're right about Chief Justice Roberts. I, 
I worked on, that was the first nomination I worked on, and, and Senator Leahy, who was then the ranking Democrat on the committee, voted for, along with 20 Democrats, voted for Roberts. He, he had 80 votes. And I know that for Senator Leahy, that sort of institutional preservation idea was important. He did not agree. He didn't anticipate that he would agree with Chief Justice Roberts' decisions on the court most of all. Um, you don't, it's not, they're not single issue justices. So, so you can agree with some and disagree with some, but he voted for him out of that institutional concern. Um, I, I know with Chief Justice Roberts, the decision in the Shelby County case, which struck down a key part of the Voting Rights Act, which had just been reauthorized by, by almost the entire Senate and Congress signed into law by a Republican president, was, was such a, a terrible decision uh, in Senator Leahy's view and mine um, that it really changed his view of, of Chief Justice Roberts. It was a real, it was a disappointment because it was, it was a court reaching into a really democratic process where there had been 20,000, 40,000 pages of testimony, 20 hearings, fact finding by the Senate said, we still need these laws. And the minute the court struck down Shelby County, you had state, a bunch of states enact uh, a huge barriers to voting that we hadn't seen in a generation, which then has consequence again for how we arrange our politics. So um, in this context, um, I think the, the, the nomination, even before we got to the sexual uh, uh, assault allegations, Roe v. Wade is sort of in, is, is widely perceived as being in peril. Um, and if not overturned, dramatically narrowed uh, by, by the court. Um, you, you certainly have four votes for it on the court now. Um, everything about Judge Kavanaugh's record suggests to be a fifth vote. Um, he praised Chief Justice Rehnquist for not going along with Roe. He's written in his emails that Roe is not settled law. Um, and uh, in a very disturbing case, and I, I think it's one, and I'll, then I'll hand over the mic mm -hmm. metaphorically, the, well, and this is where I think you connect his jurisprudence to these allegations. He's talking about, there's this idea of dismissing what happened when he was 17. He was the age you are now when these assault allegations occurred. Well, it didn't matter. He's young. He was drinking. It, it shouldn't impact him 36 years later. Well, just a couple years ago, he ruled on a, uh, he, he dissented in a, in a case um, uh, called Doe v. Garza, which is a DC, DC Circuit case. It's involved an undocumented immigrant, a young woman who was pregnant. Um, there was some suggestion that she may have been raped. She did not want to keep the baby. She sought and uh, received from the court permission to get an abortion, uh, uh, a substitute for parental a, a, consent. A, a Texas state court that is notoriously stingy in allowing yeah, yeah, these that's things. That's right, in allowing these things. It was a hard thing to get. So she had a legal, the court had already said, you have a, a right to go get this abortion. That she was in, in, in federal custody because she was an undocumented immigrant. They wouldn't let her out to go get the abortion. And if you read the, the argument, the oral argument, and, and what Judge Kavanaugh did was he tried to find ways to keep her in custody long enough that she couldn't get the abortion, that the court had already said she had a right to get. She was, she was 16 years old. This is somebody with no, wasn't from a country club, wasn't rich, didn't have family support, had sought and gotten this. This is how he would treat the most vulnerable member of our society, somebody who was the age he was during these allegations. And you don't think that impacts her life? And, and by the way, if you think that's just a judge applying law or calling balls and strikes, that, no, I think, I think that we know who Judge Kavanaugh is, and we know, you know, I, I, it, 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 the idea that, and to go to your initial question, the idea that not one but two justices on the Supreme Court, if he was confirmed, would have credible allegations of sexual harassment or assault, and then be deciding the ability of women to access health care and, 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 and their reproductive rights should be scary to you. And, and maybe, you, maybe, you disagree, maybe you disagree with Roe v. Wade. Maybe that's something you support. I should not prejudge that. But, but whatever it is, know that this will have consequence for you, not just now, but for the many years that he is on the court and, and for the many years whatever decisions are handed down are law, to your point. So you know, that's, that's sort of my, my view of, of, of why it really matters and why you want to believe that this is somebody above uh, reproach. Let me just make a couple quick points. Um, you know, the, the possibility that a Justice Kavanaugh would be serving under the cloud of, of the sexual assault allegations and, and, and Justice Thomas with the Anita Hill uh, and other allegations. These would not be the only justices who have been on the court uh, under a cloud. I mean, there's a famous example of Hugo, Justice Hugo Black. Uh, who has a, he, he was appointed by Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was, Black was, was Roosevelt's first uh, appointment to the Supreme Court. And it, it turned out shortly after he had been confirmed uh, that, uh, that Hugo Black, as a younger man, had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, now, in the 1930s, being a member of the Ku Klux Klan was a really big deal. I mean, we're still 
in the era of segregation. And there was a very large controversy about whether Justice Black should remain on the court under the circumstances. He did, um, and he served for almost 35 more years. Um, over those years, Justice Black carved out a notable record of, of generally very strong support uh, for civil rights issues and, and things like that. So if it turns out that we have justices who are on the court, who are under a cloud, they will face a burden of persuading us, all of us, that they are in fact doing their jobs in a conscientious way, not somehow affected or prejudiced by the matters of controversy that came before them. I'm not saying, we sh by the way, that we should just ignore this. I'm just suggesting that if it turns out that Judge Kavanaugh gets confirmed, um, he will face, for a, with a lot of us, uh, questions about whether he is really approaching cases uh, with the kind of judicial uh, but perspective. Jonathan, if I can disagree with you a little bit, the problem is that he's not an elected official. If he were an elected official, I would agree with you 100% that he'd have to now persuade me that he could work in a judicious way. But he has a lifetime appointment, people. And that says, during good behavior, basically that means like you can't commit treason, right? So once he's there, he doesn't have to please anybody. Well, it's the same process for removal as for president, yeah. which, is, which is incredibly onerous. To do. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have to please anybody. He can say, I got the stamp of approval, I got through, now let me continue with my agenda. Well, but this, I think, goes to what does a justice do once you get there? It is true, of course, that, that once you're confirmed, you're there for good. Um, but I think most justices have some sense that they will have a reputation that follows them to the grave. And so I, I'm not trying to be Pollyanna about this, but I, 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 all I mean to say is that we, we might not be able to push a, ju a justice off the court who's under a cloud, but I think that there may be some pressures on the justice, not coming from us, has, has Justice Thomas ever acted as if he was worried about the public's perception? He's still famously embittered about the the the, the thing the, the process he called a high tech lynching. Yeah. Uh, and and or he didn't call it. It was no. He, no, yeah, he, 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 he called high tech lynching. Yeah. Yes. And and you know he's been uh, uh, so hostile to women's rights on the bench. I don't think he cares. Right, and the legacy that you leave, that you want to be proud of, is very different for other people. If Judge Kavanaugh thinks that his legacy should be returning originalism to the prevailing view of constitutional interpretation, he can do that, and that's not going to please any of the progressive people who believe in a living constitution. Right. Well, thank you guys. I think we have to move on to some questions from the audience. This is where this gets tough, right? Ooh. Hello everyone, my name is Nicholas Caraballo, a junior at Solon High School and a member of the Youth Forum Council. Today we are enjoying a Youth Forum panel discussing partisanship in the Supreme Court, featuring Jonathan L. Enton, the David L. Brennan Professor Emeritus of Law and Adjunct Professor of Political Science at Case Western Reserve University, Jeremy Paris, Principal at the Rabin Group and former Chief Counsel for Nominations and Oversight for the Je Senate Judiciary Committee, and Lisa A. Tucker, Associate Professor of Law at the Thomas R. Klein School of Law at Drexel University. Our moderator is Youth Forum member Nehal Chigurupati. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our live stream. If you would like to tweet your question, please tweet it to at City Club Youth and we'll ask them as time allows. We ask that your questions be brief, to the point, and actual questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and our microphone holders will come to you. Holding microphones today are Youth Council members Alana Johns and Dorothy Bogan. May we have the first question, please. Are, are you a student, sir? No, <laughs> I've actually been to Friday lunch with the professor. My question is, based on the distrust on Washington, what would have happened if Ranking Member Feinstein had gone into uh, Member uh, Chairman Grassley's office and said, I have this letter concerning me 
seven weeks ago. How much would the process have changed, if at all? Um, can I can I start? Yeah, this, this is my this is, this is what I handled. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, um, so it's an interesting question. So to give the, the, the everybody the benefit of, of the context, um, Dr. Blasey Ford uh, uh, initially did not make uh, uh, public her allegations. She raised them, tried to raise them before when she saw that Judge Kavanaugh was a potential nominee. Uh, then she sent a letter to her congresswoman to pass it on to Senator Feinstein, but asked that her name be kept confidential, did not want it to be public. Um, and I know when this first then surfaced, and still today, Chairman Grassley is angry that this didn't come up sooner or before Judge Kavanaugh's hearing. Um, but what I have come to understand from hearing from and talking to people who work with uh, uh, survivors of sexual assault that it was really important that Senator Feinstein respected her wishes on when and how to come forward or whether to come forward at all. And, and it only surfaced uh, when somebody leaked her name and her story was going to be told. And she decided that she wanted to tell her own story. So um, I, I, I think, I will say this, I think this is a lifetime appointment. I think the allegations are specific, they're credible. Uh, I think watching her today, they're specific and credible. I think the timing is not necessarily irrelevant, but next to irrelevant. We should get this right. And by the way, doing a, an FBI background investigation, which is done for every nomination, which was done with Anita Hill, would have taken three days for them to talk to witnesses, corroborate the claims, talk to Mark Judge, one of the other eyewitnesses. This is what they do for every judicial nominee with, with Anita Hill, and those allegations took three days. We'd already be done with it. So, so the idea that the timing is, is particularly material here, I, I think is, is wrong. Um, I, I also believe that there's so much I don't know about how to handle these kind of claims. I'm learning from smart people uh, about how, how uh, uh, to handle these kind of claims from survivors. And I'm, um, I'm still shaken by the morning. I mean, I'm, I'm a sort of in awe of her courage. And I, I, I mean, when this first came up and the time came up, I actually almost tried to back out. I said, can we move this? This is gonna be almost impossible. Um, and, and I feel like uh, it's, it's so important to talk to you about it that I'm glad that we're doing it. But uh, uh, that's sort of my view. You, got, you guys maybe have different view. I mean, I, I understand the criticism. Um. I, I don't have any particular insights about the dynamics within the Judiciary Committee. That's why I think yeah. I'm, I'm inclined to defer to you, yeah. Jeff, because you, you've been, Jeremy, because you've been there. Uh, uh, and uh, certainly, if there are better working relationships uh, yeah. within the committee, some of these things might, might go more smoothly. But Sometimes, no matter how smooth the working relationships are, the situation itself is just really complicated and there's no, no easy fix. And there, there has been quite a bit of bad faith built up over time. I mean, not to bring the other sides of this nomination in, but the handling of the sort of documents. I mean, I was maybe Pollyannish. I was the guy that handled all these fights over which records you get when you have a Supreme Court nominee. And my view was to avoid a, a process fight. The, when Justice Kagan was nominated, the first thing that happened was the White House, Obama White House counsel said, asked archives for her, here, get everything from her time at the White House. We, I worked for Senator Leahy, worked for Senator Sessions, the Republican ranking members, sent an even broader letter saying, we need everything. We got it, it was public, we asked questions about it. That's the standard that could have been followed here. We, we've seen about 10% of, of Justice Judge Kavanaugh's records. We can go into more detail, but, but as you suggested, there are serious indication that he was not truthful with the committee during his earlier nomination or this one. And I don't think that, I'm not sure why Senator Feinstein would trust Chairman Grassley and his staff, even if she had thought to go that route, but it really wasn't her decision to make in that particular context. I, I do think the way I tried to operate, the way I wish it operated, this is the one democratic moment we want the committee to do well. I wish that there were less partisanship, uh, at least on the process side. I think that this, the, uh, the, and then I'll really drop the mic and, and let somebody else talk, but the, I don't think the way this is happening uh, uh, without an FBI investigation, without subpoenaing other witnesses, with all this background, I don't think it's helpful for anybody. I don't think, it's certainly not helpful for Dr. Ford. It's not helpful for the senators. It's not helpful for Judge Kavanaugh. Um, I, I, I do, and it's certainly not helpful for, for the American people to be able to sort of have faith in the institutions of government to be able to handle this, this thing. So, so I, I mean, to, to take out of your, your question a broader point, I, I do think that if we can restore some, as much of this to a nonpartisan process as possible, the better. Yeah, and if I'm right, please correct me, Jeremy, but the night before the first part of the hearing started, 
um, which was the less interesting part that maybe you guys weren't glued to the TV for. Because I know you're glued now, right? If you're not glued, you got to be glued. Well, unless you're okay, glued people? to this, this Right, panel, yeah. Right. But, you know, you have the flu this afternoon, so you can watch this. You got it? Um, I think the night before the hearings originally started, they dumped 42,000 documents with no time. Page, pages of documents, yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, pages of documents with no time for them to actually be reviewed. You know, I don't know enough about the timing. I'm going to leave that up to Mr. Paris. But what I can say is that when Senator Feinstein got this information, she'd already been through a couple of years of wrangling with these 11 men on the Judiciary Committee, 11 Republican men who had not been acting in good faith. They refused to hold a hearing for Merrick Garland. And when a woman is bringing out allegations against a very, very powerful man, and the person you have to trust with this information is a whole bunch of other powerful men who have shown their true colors, have gone ahead and said, you know, God, this is so stupid, and this is a this is a scam, and why would anybody believe they this? They said, we'll hear from the lady, but let's schedule the vote for Friday morning. Yeah, and we've hired a female to talk to They her. said a female assistant, by the yeah, way. Yeah, a female she's assistant, this, She's this well-regarded prosecutor. Yes, a female assistant, right? I, if I'm Feinstein, I'm pretty careful with that. Let, let me just pick up on one, the, the, on one last point that Jeremy made, which is uh, we need to find a way to make the process work better. Uh, uh, getting it to work better is not a demanding standard considering how badly <laughs> yeah. things have gone. But but that's Hold because up. Mr. Paris is no longer there, our, yeah. by the way. I was there recently. It, I was no help. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> My problem, and I, I don't have an answer to this. Yes, we need to make the process work better. I don't have any ideas for that, just to head off questions on that. Or, and, and that is what actually makes me really pessimistic, is that we seem to be in this vicious circle where everybody is fighting the last battle. Mm -hmm. So they, everybody remembers the last grievance. And they will either match or up the, oh, that's the, the and, and this is, that's right. th this is a prescription for governance disaster. Uh, so I'm not going to say you folks are the, the new generation and you're going to save us. But I don't have any good ideas. And I wish, some, I wish I did. And I hope some other folks do. All right, why don't we take another question? Yeah, I hope that's not the last, uh, <laughs> Sorry uh, about the that. end of it. Yeah, we have no good ideas. See you later. Goodbye. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about the Judge Kavanaugh nominations, um, but what type of implications does this have for future nominations? So it's a good, good follow-up to where we were, right? Yeah, I, I think that, that we, we have been get as I said at the outset, we've been getting to this point for a long time. Since it now takes only a simple majority, or in fact 50 votes if the, if the president's party uh, yeah. Uh, uh, has the vice president who can cast the tiebreaker vote. I mean, we are we are at a time where we've been seeing uh, increasingly party line votes on Supreme Court nominations, but also on lower court mm -hmm. nominations. It's almost as though people have chosen up sides. There's our judges who are good, and their judges who are bad, and so. I think that it's not likely to improve. I think we're going to see things like this going forward. I think, for example, if the, if the Democrats win control of the Senate, I think it will be very difficult for President Trump to appoint any more Supreme Court justices. And I think it will be very difficult for him to appoint any more appellate judges and maybe even district judges. But. I can envision if there are vacancies with a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate, I can see party line votes on those. Uh, and that comes back to, to Professor Tucker's comment about the rule of law. The idea of the rule of law is that we trust the judges to make a conscientious decision in the case before them. Cases that get to the Supreme Court are by definition hard. Many of those cases mm -hmm. raise questions to which reasonably competent, conscientious judges 
could decide in different ways. So let's not be naive. Even if we lived in a totally apolitical environment, any conscientious judge who is facing a hard question is going to have to decide on the basis of the person's values and background and experience. But the idea is we don't expect judges are going to decide only on the basis of politics. And I think we are at a time when people increasingly suspect that the law is only politics. So I think we should be more transparent. I actually think more, not less, transparency might be an answer to how to move forward. Um, to your point, I, I think one of the, 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 the worst talking points it was always just, you know, it, we saw it with Justice Gorsuch. And by the way, that was a, a tough, normal process, even after the, the Merrick Garland stuff. But we saw this whole thing of, like, you're just a judge. He said, I'm just a judge. I just applied the law. And look, they were all just judges who applied the law. Merrick Garland is an incredibly well-regarded uh, uh, D.C. Circuit judge who just applies the law, comes up with very different answers to these same questions as, as Judge Kavanaugh, who sits on the same court. Um, I, I think it matters who, who, who the nominee is. It matters what their approach to the law is. Right. What is their view of the breadth of certain constitutional clauses? The Constitution, the reason it's worked for as long as it does, is it's, it's a sort of general roadmap. There's some specific things, and there's some broad things, and how the courts interpret them really matters. So it, it mattered a great deal, the difference between a Garland, Justice Garland, and a Justice Gorsuch. We all know it matters. Uh, uh, and if it didn't matter, uh, Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans wouldn't have stonewalled Garland. They would have said, sure, make this guy a justice. We'll make another guy, somebody else a justice next year. And I think the more we unpack that, Ju uh, Judge Kavanaugh was chosen to meet. So President Trump, I mean, let's go back to the nomination for a second. President Trump, is, is, he does us a favor sometimes, which is that subtext becomes text. He says what he thinks all the time. <laughs> I mean, he's very clear. He said during, uh, when he was a candidate for president, he's like, I'm going to select a justice uh, uh, who would strike down Roe v. Wade immediately. Talk about actually uh, criminalizing women who, you know, who, get, who get abortions. He said, I want somebody who's going to have an expansive view of the Second Amendment. He said, I'm going to want somebody who's not going to make the mistake Judge Roberts, Justice Roberts did of upholding the Affordable Care Act. Those, those were the litmus tests. And presumably, uh, uh, Judge Kavanaugh, just like Justice Gorsuch, was selected to meet those litmus tests. I think we should believe him. I think that's what he was selected to do. I think that, that if there were more questions and answers, okay, so how are you going to do that? What's, what's your approach to the law? Instead, what you hear from the nominees is, well, I can't answer that. It might come before me. Well, that's why you need to answer it. We need to know more, not less, about their legal approach. Not the specific cases uh, and, and controversies for them, but I, I actually think that's one way to, because there's kind of this, uh, can I use this word in a student form? There's kind of a, like a bullshit that goes over the whole thing. Is that a problem? All right. It's kind of a bullshit that goes over the whole thing of like pretending that something's not going to be real when it is. I think if, if it was more transparent, we'd all feel a little better about it. Um, and, and, and I think that the American people, you all, when you're voting in two years, uh, could judge more you know, clearly what, what you could judge, you know, how people are selecting judges more clearly. I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I, I don't know if that's a prediction, but like maybe it's a hope. I think if we go back to transparency, some of the sting can come out of the process and can be more open. I actually have a question. So oh, you can both hold the mic and ask a question. I love it. Um, so I've heard some people suggest term lim setting term limits as a possible reform for the Supreme Court. What do you guys right think of that? Yeah, well, um, a lot of people have suggested this. One of the most popular proposals has been to have 18-year terms, which would then allow pretty much every president to have at least one nomination. And there certainly are pros and cons to that idea. The biggest con, especially as we've been talking about partisanship and this, the current political environment, is that it would require a constitutional amendment. And the constitutional amendment process is a very, very rigorous one, one that is far b beyond simple majorities. You need, I think it's two thirds of Congress and then three quarters of the states to ratify within a certain period of time. And so the likelihood of one of those proposals being able to be implemented, I would say during our lifetimes on some of these things, including Roe. And you know, statistics show us that one third of women in their lifetime will access abortion services. One third of women, one third of the people in this room, or if not you, one third of your sisters and moms and best friends, right? And so this is a really big deal. So one thing about 18 years is that it would limit how long any one justice or any one political party could control. Let me give you an example. 
um, in, was it 1986, the court decided a, a case called Bowers v. Hardwick. It's not 86, right? And Bowers v. Hardwick was a case about two men who had been, who were lovers, who had been engaging in sexual activity in a state where it was illegal to do so, where it was a criminal act to engage in sodomy. And their case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, nope, no privacy right in the Constitution protecting your right to have sex, consensual sex with another adult in a private setting. No right. 17 years later, in 2003, we had a different court, and the court reversed Bowers v. Hardwick in a case called Lawrence v. Texas. Basically the exact same facts, but the court, different justices. And the court said, yes, there is this right to privacy. Well, they didn't call it a right to privacy. They called it a liberty right. But it's not a distinction needed to worry about. But what they said is, you're an adult. If you want to have sex in private, go for it. Nobody can tell you with whom or what you should be doing. Right? 17 years. That's all it took. On the other hand, there was an abortion case that dealt with very late term abortions, which are usually administered only when there's a significant risk to the mother's life or when there's some unbelievable genetic abnormality in the fetus where the fetus would either not survive the birth or would die soon after birth. These, these types of abortions almost never occur outside of those circumstances. The court upheld the procedure as within Roe and then just a few years later, different justices on the court, the court changed course. So term limits, what it would accomplish would allow the law to be changed. Now, there are downsides to that. One of the reasons that we respect what we call precedent is because people are on notice for what the law is. Mm -hmm. And we know what the law is, and we want it to be consistent so that people know what their rights are. So just as easily as we can change abortion rights or LGBT rights, we could also change voting rights or um, rights to um, you know, attend the school with kids who aren't of your same race, right? So. We can talk about changing the law, but that always has its upsides and it always has its downsides. I think that there are some, there, even if we could adopt a term limit scheme, I think that there will be really complicated implementation issues. Mm -hmm. Like, you know. What do we do with the ones we got? Right, exactly. <laughs> but let me make I a. Good ideas. Well, yeah. okay. So I think. We need to have the in the in the talking. you know in the near term, I don't see that as resolving the issues here, and and so, um, you know, maybe smart people can try to work out a lot of those those details. I do want to make one sort of more general observation about the stakes with with the Supreme Court. You know, I clerked for Justice Ginsburg. Um, she made a huge difference, I mean, almost single-handedly, uh, Justice Ginsburg, as a lawyer and law professor, transformed the way the Supreme Court and many of us thought about gender and sex roles and things like that. But, I, and so I think it is really important to think about who's on the court and what it's doing. But we should also recognize that the court is not going to resolve everything. Think about Brown against Board of Education. Yes, the Supreme Court said segregation is unconstitutional, it's wrong, uh, we, need to, we need to remedy that. But it took years for schools to be desegregated, and much of the desegregation that ultimately took place took place as a result of legislative and executive action. And so one thing, whatever our views may be about constitutional law and the role of the Supreme Court, let's keep in mind that in at least some circumstances, even if the Supreme Court comes out wrong, mm -hmm. there may be other forms of political and social action that can mitigate those harmful effects, which is why my co-panelists have talked a couple of times about the fact that you know, it's important to vote because who winds up in offices from, from right. Washington down to the local level can make a huge difference. It's not like either or, it's like keep your eye on the big picture. 
you know, and I, I, I don't know if there's another question out there. I had something to add, but no, yeah, why don't you ask? I'll, I'll find my way to make my point no matter what you ask, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I'd like to start off and say I go to Shaw High School. My name is Brian, and I want to know how do Christine know who to trust since she was going against somebody who was so powerful in office? Like, how did she come in and say, hey, this is what happened, this is what's going on? How did she know who to trust about that? How does, how does Dr. Ford know who to trust? I mean, no, no, Chris, the, Christine, isn't that the lady named it? Yeah, yeah. The, the testimony, how did she, how, how did she trust? I, I mean, I, I think it took courage. I, I don't know that she does trust the panel that she's before. I think she weighed the 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 cost of not speaking uh, versus the, the the cost of speaking. Um, I don't think she's being treated particularly well, uh, and I think it's a very trying day. And as I understand, it's probably re-traumatizing for her to have to relive this not only in her testimony but in response to questions. Um, so I I think uh, I mean I I am sort of in awe of her courage and she clearly this was a hard day for her uh, uh, to be up there um, and I think it says a lot I, I think one thing that happens um, talking about the courts and, and the sort of entrenchedness of the number of years everyone's on the court there's this sort of gross thing where I think sort of elite legal circles wrap their arms around and the idea that Brett Kavanaugh was certain to be confirmed meant that everybody who went to Yale Law School with him or Yale with him sung his praises uh, he had a, a liberal uh, lawyer, a, a woman who's a partner at a big firm in D.C., come and introduce him. Her practice is advocating before the Supreme Court. She doesn't want to be in the bad side of justice. They wrap themselves in power, and it's very hard to then speak truth. And I think that that's where courage comes up. Um, the other thing I want to say, and this was going to be the point I was going to make, but I think it sort of fits your, it does actually fit your, your question. I think it matters a whole lot whether our, our elected officials represent our whole society, whether the courts represent our whole society, the diversity or lack of diversity on the Senate Judiciary Committee is a real problem. It, it's, it, uh, the Republicans are all white men. Uh, uh, on, on the Democratic side, uh, Dianne Feinstein, who's the ranking member, Senator Feinstein's a, a, a woman famously got on, on the Senate after Anita Hill in the year of the woman. And, and now you have, I, I worked for Senator Maisie Hirono, who's actually the only immigrant in the US Senate, an Asian American woman. Um, uh, uh, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris are African American are now on the committee. Um, that also changes their view of, of uh, people bring life experiences to it. I think one of the real problems with the Supreme Court is, is that um, it, it's a lot of people from the same law schools. Uh, it's a lot of white men. It's still, uh, uh, there are only three uh, women on the court and only four women in its history. Um, I think when that changes, how, they, how people look at cases will also change. So, one, one of the things that Barack Obama was very successful doing, whether, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, uh, President Obama really did a lot for diversifying the federal judiciary at all the levels. Um, and nearly every one of President Trump's nominees at every level has been uh, white. I think everyone all but one, and, and most have been women. Uh, side note, I think there are plenty of really conservative federal judges that would have, I would have disagreed with almost everything they do that would have been much easier to confirm than Brett Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. um, it, it didn't have to be Kavanaugh or Buss for them. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm very unclear what, why they're pursuing this at this point. And if I can go to your question, you were asking how did she know who to trust initially when she oh. came forward with uh, her al allegation? I mean, I think oh. you answered half of it, right? Um, the wrong half. She's got your right half. She's well, professor. you know, she she wrote to her congressperson, her representative in Congress, which, you know, is always a good idea. They're supposed to have your best interests in mind. They're supposed to care about what you have to say, even if you're not of voting age yet, by the way. Um, but at that point, she probably didn't know, right? Senator Feinstein's a pretty famous person, and she would have been able to do a little bit of research about the senator. But almost immediately, she got a lawyer. And what I want you to remember is that there are lawyers out there who will represent your interests. And if you have a really important case, many of them will do it for free. And once a lawyer is representing you, that lawyer is obligated by the ethical code to represent your interests. It's not about the Senate anymore. It's not about who would make a good Supreme Court justice. It's not about anything except for you and your interests. So if you ever find yourself in a similar situation, it doesn't have to be this. It can be that the police did something wrong. It can be that someone abused you. It can be that you saw a friend have something terrible happen. 
do a little bit of research, look for somebody. You know, you can type in words like civil rights attorney and you will come up with a person who does this kind of work and after that, they will have to represent your interests. Yeah. You are also in control. If you feel like that person is not representing your interests, you can fire them and you can get somebody who will. And so you have much more power than you think. And one of the things that really spoke to Dr. Ford's intelligence for me right off the bat was she has some really excellent lawyers who happen to be women, by the way. And I think that were I in this position, that would matter to me. Because unfortunately, many women my age, I will tell you I'm 50 years old, many women my age have experienced what Dr. Ford has experienced. And so I think you look for somebody to whom you can relate and who is obligated to take you seriously. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Okay. Let me just underscore, we've been talking about judges and lawyers, but it is the clients who really matter here. And if you think back through American history, you think to people like Rosa Parks. I mean, it takes incredible courage mm -hmm. to stand up. You have to take some kind of leap of faith. I don't, and I think in some way that's what uh, Christine Blasey Ford has done here. There are lots of people out there who may have grievances, who may have legitimate claims, but those folks have to be, feel empowered that if they come forward that they will get help. And think about how many things affect someone who comes forward besides just the fact that they're going to have to sit in front of the Senate in that seat, right? She has young children. Can you imagine what her young children are going through at school right now? Every kid in the nation knows. She talked this morning about the unbelievably vile death threats that she's been getting. I was part of, I don't know if you guys were, um, a Facebook fundraiser that was raising money on GoFundMe to help with her security. It, they raised more than $200,000 in one day to contribute to her having adequate security. She will never be forgotten, right? You ever bring up the name Christine Blasey Ford again, everybody's going to remember her for this, not for her psychological research, not for being a great citizen, not for being a great parent. This is it. Can you imagine what that's like? That's a, that's a really, really, really big deal. And it is for anybody, like you said, Rosa Parks, it is for anybody who steps forward to do the right thing. Right? When Barack Obama ran for president, his wife was so frightened. Why? She thought he'd be assassinated. Right? She did. It's kind of a miracle he wasn't, isn't it? Right? It takes real courage to be these trailblazing people. We have to have respect. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have any more time for questions, um, so I'll give it over to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Wilson, a senior at Orange High School and a member of the YFC, and today we, are lis we have listened to a youth forum on partisanship and the Supreme Court. All city youth club forums are sponsored by AT&T. We appreciate their generous support for our student programming. We also thank those inv individuals and foundations listed in today's program that provide funding to support free student attendance at city club forums year-round. Our community partner is the Veal Youth Entrepreneur Fo Entrepreneurship Forum, our hospitality man partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine. Additionally we, additionally, we welcome students from Bard High School, Early College Cleveland, the Cleveland School of Science and Medicine, High Tech Academy, Laurel Schools, um, Lutheran West High School, Maple Heights High, and Shaw High School. We thank you all for being here today. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. Paris, Mrs. Tucker, thank you, Nahal, for moder um, moderating, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.